Our scripture this morning comes from Titus chapter 2. Well, we'll be picking from a lot of different places, but Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14 is where we want to start this morning. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So, we set out on a four-week mini-journey that if we are captive to the Holy Spirit's calling, I believe, has the potential to change our lives. We're going to examine the Scriptures. We're going to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit as we consider the topic the next four weeks of God's grace. It's a really big topic. Have you ever just pondered the depth of God's grace. Now this is a journey that, that all of us are going to take together no matter where we are in our walk. Seasoned saints, those who maybe are on the fence about a lot of issues, we're going to look at it through the lens of grace. Now, the theology of grace is so vast that we can study it a lifetime and and never fully comprehended, much less in four short weeks. But I hope this will be a beginning of a journey together that each of us will spend the rest of our, our lives on the, on the journey of learning and entering into God's grace and being empowered by God's grace to live more godly and holy lives. So today, the topic that we're going to approach is, is this, that God's grace is much more than just forgiveness. God sends His grace in many different ways, and one of those ways is to teach us a new way of, of being, a new way of living. So let me start out this morning. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story, but it's one that you might not expect to hear in church, and it might be difficult for some folks to hear because maybe it rings home for something that you've lived through. But it's a story of, of a great Christian lady her name was Miss Betty. She was my Sunday school teacher growing up in the early elementary classes. And of her husband, Lloyd. Now, they have both gone to be with the Lord. So, uh, And I reached out to her son to ask if I could share this, and he said, absolutely. Mr. Lloyd, most of the time, was a great guy. But every now and then, he would be given to fits of rage. And violence would, well, it was just like his entire being was taken over by violence. Almost like it owned him. And it would leave him as suddenly as it would come upon him. But when he was seized with this violence, he would beat his wife. Sometimes to the point of injury, sometimes to the point of unconsciousness. And then he would run off. And he would break down in fits of shame and would just hide for days and weep over what he had done. Now, Miss Betty, who was a Christian, would forgive Mr. Lloyd every time that this happened. Every time he would come back, she would forgive him. He would say, and quite accurately, he would say, I, I don't know what comes over me. And I don't think he really knew why he was the way he was. She loved her husband deeply, and she saw the many good sides as well as lived through the flawed sides. But she lived in fear that one time it might bring a harm that wouldn't heal. But she stayed with her husband because each time he would sincerely come back and he would earnestly beg her for forgiveness. And she saw it as her Christian duty to forgive and to extend grace. You see, at this point in her life, 
The only thing she knew of God's grace was forgiveness. She had been told growing up all her life and even in church that she was powerless over sin and that God's grace was, was there to forgive and to restore her into right relationship with God, and that's true. And she was enough of a Christian to understand that, that, hey, if God has forgiven her, then she should extend the same grace to others, especially to her husband. You see, she knew a tiny piece of God's grace, enough to put her in danger. It is God's grace that forgives and restores, and that forgiveness that we receive from God when we fall and when we sin is a very sweet forgiveness. But in that story, it's a true story. Forgiveness was still filled with torment unless there was something more. <clears throat> now, if we look at Miss Betty in this story, we want to scream, what do we want to tell her? Get out. You know, you don't have to stay and take that. That's not any sane Christian understands that, that she has no duty to remain in harm's way. And to risk injury or death because of some notion of, of grace expressed as, as a constant forgiving. And if we look at Mr. Lloyd in this story, we see a man trapped in, in many ways. He's trapped in thoughts and emotions and behaviors that, that ultimately harms everyone he's around, including himself. Now, if we look at Mr. Lloyd sympathetically, we can understand that he too is a very tormented soul in desperate need of help. Help beyond merely wiping his slate clean from sin and starting over again. The most sympathetic thing that Miss Betty could ever have done was to get away from him and help him get the help that he needed to find out what the root of the problem was and to grow and to learn and to move forward. And what about Jesus, the third member of this marriage? Now, we could no longer imagine Jesus leaving Mr. Lloyd alone in this condition, a condition, a, capture, a, a captive to anger and fits of rage and violence against his family. We could no more imagine Jesus leaving him there than we could imagine Jesus telling a homeless person in winter, get up, go on your way and be warm and your stomach filled, but not give him a coat or any food. Would a grace-filled God leave us in the condition that he finds us? Would God spend his days reminding us of, of shortcomings and demanding again and again prayers and repentance and sorrow? Would the loving creator wave his hand and say, You're forgiven, now go and sin no more, but never lift a finger to empower us to live that? Now, the story is extreme and disturbing, and I'm sad to say it did not have a happy ending. It continued and continued, and Mr. Lloyd finally fell into alcoholism and drank himself to death. And Miss Betty, from all the years of beating, endured early onset Alzheimer's from, from that, and she passed away at 60-some years old. Sometimes an extreme example is necessary to grab our hearts and to free our minds. So I, I, I ponder the question to you this morning, does God's grace simply just mean forgiveness? Or is there something more to God's antidote for our sin? Would God leave us alone in our, in our violence, in our rage? Would God leave us alone in our addictions or our depression and our isolation? If so, what a cold and comfortless God that would be. <laughs> You see, the problem is not with God's grace. The problem is with the believer's understanding of God's grace, of God's ongoing work in our lives. Now, in the Methodist realm, in theology, in the Methodist world, we, we have a view of grace that, that there is one grace, that it's all God's grace, but, but that we experience it in different ways. The first way that we experience God's grace is we, we call that prevenient grace. Now, provenient grace is God's grace in our life wooing us into a relationship with Him. Long before we even realize that we need a Savior, God's grace is at work in our lives, pulling us to Him. And then we experience God's grace as justifying grace, 
That's the point where we say yes to Jesus Christ and yes to forgiveness. Then God makes it just as if we had never sinned. We are right before God. And that's where a lot of folks' understanding of grace stops. Forgiveness of sin, we believe in faith, and we're saved. But what about the rest of our lives? There's a lot of crud to go through between salvation and eternal life. You see, God's grace is experienced all through that. We call that grace sanctifying grace. God moves us from where we are when we say yes to Jesus to where we're going to be when we get to heaven. And that journey is called sanctification. Being made holy. Whatever you want to call it, it's God's grace working in our lives to teach us how to live, how to enjoy abundant life, how to be what God has called us to be. Now, the good news is that, yes, God's grace forgives, but God's grace also guides. Set aside the question of heaven and hell after we die and think about the heaven or hell that you want to live while you're on this earth. And it's no news to us. Some folks live closer to heaven and some folks live closer to hell on this earth. We hear the term all the time, oh, that they've lived through hell on earth. Well, I don't think it'll be anything like what hell and eternal life is, but, but it's bad. God's grace is available to lead us and to guide us right now. The fabric of everyday life is alive with the grace of God. It's not just forgiveness, folks. If we wait until we have sinned to call upon the grace of God for forgiveness, then we have squandered the greater part of what grace is. Grace restores, but it also guards. It also instructs us to deny ungodly ways and teaches us the how-to of living the life of a disciple. How to live sensible, how to live upright, how to live godly in this present dark world. Scripture teaches us that we are saved by grace. The good news is that we can experience salvation here and now, and God's grace we can experience there and then as well. I've, I've shared with you John Wesley's take on, the, on, on salvation and, and his view, and I believe it is the right view, is that you know he said, I, I was saved. And then he said, I am being saved. And then he said, I will be saved. It's an ongoing moving of God's grace in our lives. Scripture teaches that we're saved by grace. The kingdom of God glides on the wings of grace. The kingdom brings righteousness and peace and joy. And the best of all, the gracious Holy Spirit wants to lead us into living righteously and peacefully and joyfully in everyday life. That's what God's grace is for. Not just forgiveness. Now, the kingdom of God is, is never attained. We don't attain the kingdom of God. We receive it. So I ask you, how are you receiving the kingdom today? The more that I read and study New Testament scripture, the more all-encompassing that grace becomes. It's the fiber of the gospel. The Bible presents a grace that continues to reach into our lives day after day in more ways than we can expect. In our text today in Titus, <coughs> it introduces to us a grace that is both familiar and also maybe unfamiliar. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was writing to a, to a young pastor named Titus. Now, Titus had traveled with Paul. Titus had been trained by Paul. And what's more, Paul had a great love for Titus. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1, verse 4, he calls Titus, my true child in the faith. So he's writing like a father to a son. And here's what Paul wants Titus to understand of the scope of God's grace. He said, the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all, all wickedness and to purify himself for himself a people that are his very own and eager to do what is good. Now, if you look at that passage, the word grace appears right beside phrases like self-control, 
upright, godly. What kind of grace is it? If grace is means simply forgiveness, then why does the scripture speak of a grace that, that teaches a new way of, of learning a new way to live? You see, most believers have a very familiarity with, with the grace that brings salvation. But as I encounter more and more people in the world who consider themselves believers, it becomes more and more obvious that that's where their understanding of grace ends. They don't understand a grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness or a grace that teaches us to say no to, to the things of this world. And if you haven't noticed, folks, the church has become more like the world than the world becoming transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Most believers are familiar with a saving grace capable of securing heaven or keeping us from hell, but have never considered the possibility that God can nurture us and move us forward, sanctify us in this present age. So there are four, and I'm just going to hit them real fast, four key points that I want us to think about this week as we move forward. The first is that, yes, grace brings salvation. That's part of God's grace that most Christians know, and it's wonderful. It is the foundation of our, of our faith, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not a gift, of, it's not from yourselves, it is the gift from God. That's Ephesians 2.8. You see, this is the starting point of our life in Christ. But it was never meant to end there. This is just the beginning. The good news is that it gets better. The second main point in this little passage is that grace teaches us to say no. God does not want us to live lives that are trapped in a cycle of, of sin and then forgiveness and repentance and then go a little while and then fall into sin again and then ask for forgiveness and repent. That's not what God wants for us. Yes, God wants us to, to seek forgiveness and to be repentant, but that's not where God wants us to live. God wants us to live free from the bondage to sin. So grace keeps on working in us and for us and through us, teaching us how to resist temptation, teaching us to say no to those temptations and to ungodliness. And we can call on the grace of God before we fall into sin. When we are facing temptations, that's the time we need to ask God for grace. Empower us, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to teach us. Help me to be uh, above this temptation. Help me to live in your grace, your power. And thirdly, we see that grace teaches us a new way to live. There's more to the Christian life than just saying no to sin. God's grace is available to replace our sinful habit patterns with self-control. Anybody here struggle with self-control from time to time? We all have those things. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The next thing you know, we've had four helpings of what we said we weren't going to do. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I'm not going to. I'm, I, I have sworn that off. And something triggers, and we get right back to it. I'm not going to drink that beer. I'm not going to because I know where that can lead me. I know where it has led me before. Then life smacks us in the face. We go down that road again. I'm not going to turn that website on. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to lust. And then we find ourselves falling into the same tracks time and time again. Folks, that is not what God has planned for his children. That is not the way we are, are to live as disciples. And the good news is that we don't have to. That through grace, God empowers us to live differently. It's not the result of trusting in our works, but rather allowing grace to teach us, grace to transform us. And that brings us to the fourth point. Grace fills us with hope. Do you see the connection in these verses? Life in Christ is not meant to be a desperate fight every day against sin, nor even a narrow focus on godly living. In verse 13, we see that, that it is God's grace that fills us with hope, hope for this life and the next. Now, let me ask you this. Would God's grace allow us to live in sin and be ruled by sin all the days of our life until we die and go to heaven? No. No. Why would grace leave us naked and bleeding on the side of the road? 
God's grace is far more than just wiping the slate clean week after week or day after day. The grace of God wants to teach you into a new way of existing, a new way of living. And if grace is the teacher, and we're the students, then the rest of our life is the classroom. We have to approach it that way. If we possess the humility to become lifelong learners of God's grace, then grace is not just something that transports us when we die to paradise. It brings heaven closer while we live. That is part of the good news. Grace not only forgives our sin, it teaches us how to live in a way that's no longer captive to that sin. I believe Paul wrote, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? The sting of death is, is the law. And he goes on to say, but, but we have God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ that we don't have to live that way. Too many believers are stuck in an unhealthy pattern because their theology of grace ends with being forgiven. And it doesn't move to being transformed and sanctified. Many times we choose sin, and that's bad. But worse still, we choose to wallow in that sin. We have this voice that whispers in our head. And it's the voice of our adversary, Satan. And he whispers enticement. And then when we step into that trap and we sin, then he shouts condemnation. He goes from a whisper to a shout. And his is a voice skilled in subtle influence followed by paralyzing guilt. Mr. Lloyd lived that every day of his life. It's a voice filled with accusation. Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies, and lies are his native tongue. And it's true that sin brings death, but God's grace wipes away the penalty and the stain of sin. Even better, grace goes further. It raises us to life and teaches us a better way, a new way. That is the glory of God. He speaks to us even in our sin. God's message is restoration, and more than that, God takes our defeat and he turns it into the very fabric of instruction. You see, God wants us to learn from our past sin. And then God wants us to go and sin no more, as he told the woman. So let me ask you, have you ever learned from your sin? Or do you just keep seeking forgiveness? God's grace is not only ready to forgive, but God's grace is eager to move us past it and forward. If we are open to God's voice and God's instruction, he will show us the path and he will correct our steps as we walk. Not just by insisting on obedience from us, but by revealing our hearts. Not by counting our sins against us, but by teaching us to move forward from those sins. For example, if we fall into anger, and that anger turns violent and sinful, God wants us to come to an understanding of the source. And then God wants to heal the wickedness that leads to that sin. If we choose greed over generosity, then God wants to reveal the insecurity of why that is and heal the wickedness that leads to the sin of greed. If we choose lust, God wants to reveal our desires, the hidden desires of our heart, and to heal the weakness that leads to sin. If we choose judgment over extending grace or judgment over forgiveness, then God wants to reveal our pridefulness and heal the wickedness that leads to that sin. Do you get the point that, that God doesn't want to just give us forgiveness? He wants to lead us, to, He wants to heal us from the wickedness that leads us there in the first place. Jesus says, go and sin no more. But he doesn't just say that. He also makes that command possible. He takes us to the source and gives us hope. And this is a kind of resurrection, a resurrection from, from a life of sin, resurrection that, you know, it's not just for Jesus. Resurrection is for us. It's, it's not just at the end of days when our bodies will rise, if you go by that teaching. It's also that, so that we can have a newness of life now. You see, sin entombs us. 
But Jesus rolls the stone of that tomb away as often as we need. And folks, if, if, if God has removed the stone that entombs us in sin, we would be foolish to sit in the tomb with the door open. We would move forward in God's light, in God's grace, and learn from him so that we wouldn't find ourselves entombed again. Our application of these verses ought to be very, very personal. We ought to pray and listen and learn. In our daily prayers, I wonder what would happen if, if each of us prayed something like, Lord God, in your Holy Spirit, open my eyes and my heart to recognize the way that your grace is working in me. It's also a part of God's grace to answer prayers. Jesus assured us that if we ask him for bread, he will not give us a stone. And if we ask God to, to reveal to us the way his grace is working and the way his, his grace is changing us, then I believe that he's going to answer that. We just need to be ready to listen. We can be confident that God will answer that prayer. And after a time of prayer, we, we need to, to have an opportunity to learn. That's why it's always important to keep a journal or a notebook or something, a card in your Bible that you can write down the answer to prayers. So after a time of prayer, what do you do? You listen. You see what God brings to your mind. What does God reveal to you about yourself? What has God revealed to you about himself? What have you discovered? You can be sure that God will lead you into a larger understanding of grace. So in the coming week, I'm going to give you a homework assignment every day. That number one, you would pray that God would open your eyes, and I'm going to do it as well. God, open my eyes and my heart to recognize your grace working in my life. And then... Write down what God brings to your mind. What do you discover about yourself? What do you discover about God? That exercise is not just about growing closer to God. It's not just about gaining biblical knowledge. It's truly about opening ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit so that we might move into deeper grace, that sanctifying grace that God has for us, that grace that wants to teach us a new way to live. So it's true that we will stumble and we're going to fall along the way. We always do. And know that there is forgiveness for grace. I mean, through, through, through grace, there is always forgiveness. But better still, there's even more grace available to learn and to grow. To help us to live the life that Jesus said he came to give us. A life more abundant. Wouldn't you like for your life to be more fruitful as a Christian? Wouldn't you like your life to be more joy-filled, more peace-filled, more hope-filled, more spirit-filled? It begins by moving in God's grace, growing in God's grace. So that's where we're going to stop today. Next week, we're going to look at, have you been paralyzed by grace? Because that's not God's intention. He doesn't want you to just stop. We're going to continue this topic of growing in grace. So, this week, your assignment is to pray that God would open your eyes and heart to see how grace is working in you and through you in your circumstances. And then, to go from there and to see what you've learned about yourself through the Holy Spirit and what God has revealed to you about himself and his grace. So let's stand and sing our closing hymn. It's on the screen. Uh, Amazing Grace. Change of God.